When sediments are deposited, they form essentially a flat layer. Therefore, sedimentary rocks begin as flat layers. However, in cases such as shown here, they obviously didn't stay that way. Structural geology is the study of the three-dimensional shape and arrangement of rock units and the processes responsible for deforming those units. Deformation refers to the change in size or shape of those rock units due to stress. Stress and strain are often thought of as meaning about the same thing, but they have different definitions within science. Stress is the action that causes strain. We previously talked about the general types of stress, confining pressure and differential stress. Confining pressure, where stress is applied uniformly in all directions, is important for the lithification of sediment. However, it doesn't normally result in a change of shape of a rock unit. Instead, that's the role of differential stress. In differential stress, forces are applied unequally in different directions. For each type of differential stress, think about what would happen if you applied that stress to a chunk of Play-Doh. Compressional stress occurs when the forces are applied directly toward each other. Smash the Play-Doh between your palms and it flattens towards your fingers. Tensional stress occurs when the forces are applied directly away from each other. Grab the Play-Doh with both hands and pull it apart. Before it breaks, it will become elongated towards your hands. Shear stress occurs when the forces are not directly toward or away from each other. It can be hard to apply shear stress to Play-Doh because that blob of Play-Doh will try to rotate. Well, rocks try to do the same thing, but it's the surrounding rocks that prevent the rotation. All three types of differential stress can break rock, but materials resist each of the three types of stress differently. For example, concrete is very resistant to compressional stress, but it is easily broken by tensional stress. However, steel is very resistant to tensional stress, which is why it is used in reinforced concrete. All three types of differential stress can also break a wooden pencil. However, you would probably use just one if you had to break a pencil. Which type of stress would you use? You almost certainly would snap it in half using the shear stress. Grab a pencil and see if you can use tensional stress to break it. I haven't seen a person pull apart a pencil, but if someone could keep their fingers from sliding off, it might be possible. Certainly, machines can pull pencils apart. It's a little easier, although not easy, to break a pencil with compressional stress, but please do not try that. If you succeed, you'll impale your hands with large wooden fragments. Now let's go back to the pencil example and think about snapping it in half again. You should be able to flex the pencil a little without breaking it. The pencil and most other objects have at least a little zone of elastic deformation, where any change in size or shape is temporary. Eventually, if enough, if enough stress is applied, the change becomes permanent. That's plastic deformation. There are two types of plastic deformation, which are dependent on the type of response. If the object bends, it's ductile deformation. If the object breaks, it's brittle deformation. Whether a rock or any other object has plastic deformation that is ductile versus brittle depends on four variables. Temperature might be the most obvious. At high temperatures, objects are more likely to bend. As a result, rocks deep in the earth are more likely to experience ductile deformation than rocks near the surface. Increased confining pressure and longer time over which the stress is applied also tend to lead to ductile deformation. The influence of rock type is not as easily simplified. In general, igneous rocks and non-foliated metamorphic rocks are more likely to experience brittle deformation than sedimentary rocks and foliated metamorphic rocks. But 
all rocks can experience either type of plastic deformation depending on the other factors. Whether a rock is folded or faulted depends on the type of plastic deformation it undergoes. If the rock is bent, a fold is formed. If the rock snaps, there's a fault created. Most folds will be the result of compressional stress. If you have a pile of loose paper in front of you, apply a compressional stress from the edges and the paper will bend up or bend down. In either case, you've created a fold reducing the area the paper is covering the same way mountain building does. A simple fold will have two parts, or limbs, one on either side of the hinge, hinge line. An axial plane is an imaginary two-dimensional object that goes through the hinge line and separates the limbs both at the surface and underground. In this example, the axial plane is perfectly vertical, but that only happens in very rare cases where the limbs are perfectly symmetrical. The two basic types of folds are anticlines, where the rocks are folded up, and synclines, where the rocks are folded down. The way I learned to remember these was that an anticline has the shape of an anthill. Now, in reality, it is unusual to just see a single anticline or a syncline by itself. Instead, you're likely to see a series of anticlines next to synclines. Anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline. This image shows even a little more complexity. In the case of symmetrical folds, the limbs are mirror images of each other, and the axial plane is vertical. If the limbs have rock units at different angles, an asymmetrical fold is formed, and the axial plane that separates the limbs is tilted. An overturned fold occurs when one of the limbs of the fold is moved beyond vertical. In the extreme case, an overturned fold can appear to have one limb lying directly on top of the other. That is a recumbent fold. The simplest kind of fold is a monocline and can be thought of as a fold with only one limb. This is a case where rock type is more important than the other factors that determine whether deformation is ductile or brittle. Even though the igneous rock below the layered sedimentary rock is hotter and under more confining pressure, it broke from compressional stress, while the rocks on top only bent from that stress. Circular folds can be caused by a compressional stress, but there are other methods that are more common. For example, the upward bent rocks in a dome can result from growth of salt underneath. This is especially common in the Gulf of Mexico where domes serve as oil traps. Basins are downward bent rocks that can form from the weight of overlying sediment. The underground geology of Illinois is essentially a large basin that allowed the accumulation of swampy sediments over millions of years. This is why the state has coal underneath almost all parts of the state. If a rock is exposed to stress and doesn't bend, it can break. Faults are places where rocks have broken and there has been movement along the break. At this road cut, we see particular layers that stand out because of color differences. If you are viewing this on a small screen, I've underlined a white bed in red. And they are offset along fault lines. I've only marked a few of the faults visible on this photo. We classify faults by their relative motion, and in this case, rocks have moved up or down relative to each other. Faults in which rocks have mainly moved up or down are dip-slip faults. If the movement is mainly horizontal, it's a strike-slip fault. It's rare for a fault to show only vertical or only horizontal movement, but this simplifies talking about them. Before we put more specific names on the types of faults, we need to orient ourselves. In cutaway views of underground, it is useful to draw a mine shaft along the fault. One side of the fault will be hanging above your head as you stand in that mine shaft. That's the hanging wall. The other side will be under your feet. That's the foot wall. In a normal dip-slip fault, the hanging wall moves down, 
This is the result of tensional stress or the absence of stress that allows the hanging wall to slide down the fault due to gravity. Reverse dip-slip faults form when the hanging wall moves up. This can only happen with extreme compressional stress, such as during, during mountain building. If the fault is at a low angle from horizontal, such as shown here in green, it is more specifically called a thrust fault. Strike slip faults have experienced side to side movement, such as commonly occurs at transform plate boundaries. To determine what kind it is, imagine yourself standing anywhere on the surface within this illustration. Now look toward the fault. Now look across the fault and tell me in what direction the other side appears to have moved. This is an example of a right lateral strike slip fault because the opposite side appears to have moved right. And it doesn't matter what side of the fault you stand on, the answer will still be the same. So now take a look at this fault and tell me what kind it is. Again, nature is more complex than your textbook. When geologists look at strike-slip faults, they usually refer to them as a fault system because it's a network of fault lines rather than just a single place where movement occurs. Like faults, joints are breaks and rocks. However, in this case, no movement has occurred. Most visible joints are formed from the cooling of thick layers of basalt. As the rock contracts, when it cools, it fractures into tall columns. In North America, we can see the results of two major orogenic episodes. Orogenesis refers to mountain building events, and we have two major mountainous regions on the continent, the Appalachians and the Rockies. Younger mountains are more angular because they haven't had their sharp edges removed by erosion yet. They also tend to be taller with less vegetation. Most mountain building will happen at convergent plate boundaries, but you might remember that there are three different types depending on what types of plates are converging. In each case, the orogenesis is slightly different. When two oceanic plates collide, the older and therefore denser plate is subducted. Water squeezed out of the subducting plate lowers the melting point of the overlying rock. This melted material is now less dense and rises to the surface. The volcanoes in this case are in the ocean and form a volcanic island arc, such as the Japanese islands. The area between the volcanic arc and a trench is called a four arc area. And this will be more important on the next slide. When a continental and oceanic plate collide, a continental volcanic arc is formed. The process is very similar to when two oceanic plates converge, but a continental plate has a greater ability to scrape sediments off the oceanic plate. This creates an accretionary wedge. As the accretionary wedge continues to grow, it can be pushed above sea level. At that point, the rest of the four arc area gets filled in with sediment that's coming from the eroded, uplifted accretion area wedge and the mountains created earlier. California is a great example of what happens at a convergent boundary with one oceanic and one continental plate. Although today, California is at a transform boundary. Millions of years ago, there was an oceanic plate colliding with North America. Subduction of that oceanic plate formed the continental volcanic arc. Over time, the accretionary wedge was pushed up above sea level, and the convergent boundary ended because the oceanic plate was used up. At that point, with no more subduction, there was no more volcanic activity. And the mountains began to weather to expose the large batholiths of the Sierra Nevadas that we see today. Since then, both the uplifted accretionary wedge and the batholith have been subject to weathering, and the sediments have accumulated within that four-arc basin, which we now call the Central Valley of California.
The third type of convergent boundary usually starts with oceanic crust between the two approaching continents. But what happens to all that material that's in between? Some of the oceanic crust will be subducted before the continents collide. But everything else is pushed up into the mountains. The zone where the two continents are welded together is called a suture. But more broadly, the entire mountainous region is known as a fold and thrust belt. This is because as the continents continue to compress together, the rocks are either folded or faulted in the case of thrust faults. In some cases, plates aren't carrying entire continents, but just small segments of land. These segments can be volcanic island arcs or even sections ripped off of other continents. In either case, the segments are known as terrains, and they're recognizable as having a different geologic history than the continent upon which they are accreted. This is largely how the northwestern portion of North America was formed.